Good morning. Welcome to our study this morning. We're continuing our 2021-2022 Revelation verse-by-verse -verse series, and we're in lesson whatever. Uh, this is the We're in lesson chapter two, verse nine, part two. This is uh, where we're at. Okay. And um, this is our key study for the rest of the book of Revelation. And the reason so, you'll see today, uh, there's going to be a lot of parts to it because it is very difficult to cover all of the history of Satan in a <laughs> in a uh, in an hour or two okay and that's what we're dealing with so we'll uh, we'll get on with it so we can see let's begin uh, with prayer father yahoo we are grateful for your word we admire what you have produced for us to be able to understand your plan, your eternal purpose, and what is going to transpire in the last days. We ask that you show us wisdom uh, by teaching us these things by your spirit so that we might have a proper understanding of things uh, and not uh, be confused by all of what we see going on around us and what we see will happen in the future. We thank you for it in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Okay, uh, we'll begin by clarifying something I presented last week that due to a slide malfunction left everyone a little confused. Uh, so uh, first we'll start with Luke's genealogy through Joseph. Okay. So here uh, you'll notice that Luke, uh, this is chapter 3 of Luke, that he begins with God, and then Adam, and then down to uh, Seth, and Enoch, and Kenan, and Mah Mah Mahalel, and Jared, uh, Enoch, uh, I'm sorry, I said Enoch first, Enosh, and then down to Enoch, and you can follow all the way down, there are 77 members in this genealogy, and something to pay attention to is right here at David. Yeah, okay, that worked out okay. Uh, at, after David, you see Nathan. Nathan. Okay. Now, if we go to uh, the Matthew genealogy, and we look at what goes on there, and we see David. But after David, we see Solomon. Right. You see, we see David at number 14, and then it jumps up to Solomon, number 15. Well, in Luke's, it goes from David to Nathan. And we need to understand why. And so I've given you another target here at number 28. That's Jehoiachin, also known as Jeconiah. He has about three names in the, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, and uh, this particular list chose Jehoiachin. And Jehoiachin is uh, Jeconiah, and if we look here on your reading left, you see Jeremiah 22.30. It says, record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper, prosper. none of, uh, will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. That was spoken about Jehoiachin or Jeconiah. So that's called the Jeconiah curse. So uh, you see that in this genealogy that goes down through to Mary, that Jeconiah is there because this is the line, the, the line through David that goes to Mary, as opposed to the other line, which goes through the 
David through Nathan to Joseph. Okay? This is the legal line okay? because of Jeconiah being rejected from the line. So this is the legal line, and it goes through Joseph. Now, Joseph was not the physical parent of Jesus. So Jesus could not be born uh, of physically by, by Joseph, his stepfather, and, uh, and be legal uh, because he was virgin born. He was born only of Mary and the artificial insemination by the Holy Spirit. So, so this line gives him legal authority as the adopted son of Joseph. Okay. And then through Mary's line, he has the genetic inheritance of the throne through David by way of Solomon. Okay. So essentially what you have, and I guess maybe I just better switch over to draw it up so you can see it. So you have, uh, well, let's simplify it. We have Mary and Joseph right. coming down to Jesus. Mary provides the genetics and Joseph provides the legal. So Jesus, both of them were the descendants of David. And, and had Israel not been in captivity for all this time, Joseph would have been sitting on the throne in Israel at the time of Jesus' birth. He was the rightful king heir. He was a rightful king heir coming down that line. Now, we have to remember that throughout that line, there were all of these different lines that broke off, but, but Joseph was a rightful heir to the throne of David. But because of the Jehoiakim uh, curse, he could not sit on that throne. So we have to take away the Jehoiakim curse. Uh, uh, the, uh, he had to be go down through Nathan instead of Solomon. So Mary provides the genetics, Joseph provides the legal, and so Jesus is the legal son of David. Let's see, let's go back to this again, and, and a key feature to notice is that number, number, well, start with number one, okay? Because Mary's lineage takes it through Abraham. Okay? Not David, but Abraham. Because to Abraham, was given the promise, the birthright. And the birthright was what? The land. What did he tell Abraham? I will give you this land for all of your generations. This will be the birthright is the land. Not kingship through Abraham. Kingship comes through David. But the, the possession of the land goes through Abraham. Now, notice it goes, if you follow your numbers, one, two, three, uh, it goes from Abraham, Isaac to Jacob. And then the 12 sons of, uh, the 12 descendants of Jacob are the tribes of Israel. As Jacob's name was changed to 
Israel because he could strive, he could, he could work hard, he, could, uh, he put forth effort. So he got to be the uh, chosen one of the line. And then next you'll see Judah. Judah is the kingly line, but Judah doesn't get to inherit the land. Judah uh, acted uh, inappropriately, and so God put the line of the kingship through him still, but took the birthright of the land and gave it to Joseph. Joseph. Right? And uh, we're going to study Joseph coming up in future lessons because he's important uh, and his sons are important, but we're going to need to see them as we find out who the true Jews are and who the Jews are who say they are Jews but are not. Okay, so I wanted to clarify that and I actually put a little more in there. There's my targets there, and that's Jeconiah. See that Jehoiachin, that's uh, another of the names of Jeconiah. Okay, we're exploring an amazing prophetic revelation found in the second and third chapters of Revelation. Today, we'll continue our evaluation of prophetic revelations that will take about three or four more weeks, six or eight, and uh, to unpack the entire thing. Uh, now, to say there is an amazing revelation in a book of amazing revelations may sound strange, but I've discovered that this revelation uh, unlocks so much of the remainder of the book and shows how and why these events unfold. And I have always in the past skipped over the letters to the congregations, the assemblies, the churches, as it says in King James-related uh, translations because I didn't think there was anything of real importance to us in there uh, until I, this study this year, and I found this uh, passage, Revelation 2.9, uh, that there are those who say they are Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And then it's mentioned again in another letter, and then it is uh, mentioned in a another letter that, as we'll see, that those people live where Satan dwells. So, so there's a lot of spirit kind, spirit kind warfare that's introduced in these letters. And I thought, well, we've got to check through that. We've got to find out what all that is involved with. So that's why we're getting into this in greater depth. And the last sentence on this slide, the key word is deception. It all begins with some mysterious passages that are rarely addressed and poorly so when they are. Here's a portion of it beginning in chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, I know uh, that you can't bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are shlakim, emissaries of Israel, and are not, and found them to be liars found them to be liars. Now, now the Christendom bias translates the word that are used there for the shlichim as, as apostles, but uh, in the Hebrew, a shlichim is an emissary from Israel, okay? And since this book was written by a Jew to the Jews, about the Jews, uh, for the Jews, uh, I'm using a lot of the Hebrew terms in here so that we kind of get some of that flavor, okay? But they say they are shahim and are not, and have found them to be liars, okay? Notice here that when the disciples ask for a sign, when they asked Jesus in Matthew 24 for a sign of the end of the age, what did he say? Tell us when these things will be and what will be the, will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. See that no one deceives you. Right? Deception is repeatedly stated to be the dominant characteristic of the end of the age, and it defines our study, the study of deception. The next clue is in verse 6, but this you have, that you hate the wicked deeds of the Nicolites, which I also hate, and we're going to 
get into the Nicolites as we find out who the true Jews are and who they're not. Then there are two clues in verse 9, uh, and I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Yehudim and are not, and the other in verse 9, but are the synagogue of Satan. So he wants them to know, and all of the subsequent readers of the the book of Revelation, that there are those who are claiming to be Jews but are not, and that they are of the synagogue of Satan. Well, if it's synagogue of Satan, it's spiritual warfare, and it's important to understand that if we're going to understand the book. The next clue is in verse 6, but, you, uh, but this you have, oh, that's a repeat slide there also, okay. Uh, somehow this two, these two slides got repeated. Okay, a two-part deception that begins in Genesis and runs all the way through to the book of the Revelation. Uh, the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. That's, that's the key to understanding the book of Revelation. More cryptic information and clues are found in verse 10. Fear none of those things that you shall suffer. See, Satan will cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have uh, tribulation ten weeks. Uh, be faithful ten days. I'm sorry. Be faithful to death, and I will give you the tree of life. Okay. Uh, and this is a huge clue in uh, verse 13. Maybe, huh? Maybe. Uh, I know your mitzvah and where you dwell even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast my name. So we have a lot of Satan stuff in here, and of course, what's the book of Revelation about? Satan's attempt to overthrow God by controlling the chosen people of God, the Israelites, and becoming worshipped by them, to subvert them, and to gain their worship. So let's see. Uh, then we leave Satan, Satan uh, one of my Bible translations uh, uses Satan instead of actually saying Satan's name, and I, I kind of like it. I haven't quite decided if I'm going to continue to use it, but because uh, uh, some people that use that translation are a little bit strange, so I don't want to really be too closely aligned with using that term, but it's a good term, and it follows, it follows the Jewish concept. You know, the Jews won't actually say the name of God because they think they might blaspheme if they do, and uh, we know that certainly it's fine to say the name of God because he commands us to, uh, but uh, uh, this follows that pattern of not saying something and uh, I can see not honoring uh, Satan by repeating his name over and over again. So yeah, for now, I'll probably interchange Satan with Satan. Here's, here's this verse, uh, the two new adversaries that are going to be part of the process of determining this. I have a few things against you because you have there them that hold the teaching of Balaam, Balaam, okay? You know about Baal, okay? Uh, the uh, Baal worship or Baal worship, as it's sometimes pronounced, okay? Um, and then another one, but I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to all uh, idols, okay? So there is a woman who calls herself a prophetess, uh, and her name is Jezebel. Her name in the past was Jezebel, and Jezebel met a horrible end. She uh, fell out of the tower, and, and the dogs ate everything but her hands and her feet, and uh, so uh, this Jezebel seduces, and that was her 
key thing that she did. She was an adulteress, and she seduces God's servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So fornication is adultery. And there are two types of adultery that are referenced in the scriptures. One is physical adultery, and the other is spiritual adultery. It's going after other gods. It's leaving Yahuwah to go after other gods. Balaam and all the others that are mentioned throughout the Old Testament that they that they served rather than remaining faithful to Yahuwah. Another duplication of slides here. Well, we're going to get done a lot faster if I skip through these duplicate slides. I don't know how that happened. Uh, we'll begin with a quick reading of our context covered in the previous lessons. Then we'll proceed with an overview of our upcoming classes, an overview because there's so much information, we need a skeleton upon which to hang everything. So I'm going to give you a little skeleton. Then I'm going to start getting into putting the, the flesh on the bones after that. Chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the teaching overseer of the Kehillah, the assembly, the synagogue of, of FCA or Ephesus, right? These things says he that has the seven kokavim in his right hand. Kokavim are messengers, uh, oftentimes angel messengers, spirit kind messengers. And then it says he also walks in the midst of the seven golden menorah. And you know how I like to bring things, new things that I discover that aren't exactly related to our study, but I find them to be interesting. Uh, remember the crucifixion. And our understanding of the crucifixion, there's three crosses. On each side of Jesus, there is a, what's called in the English translations, a thief. Well, they're rebels. They're, they're uh, actually those who were fighting against the Romans, okay? Trying to, trying to uh, uh, revolt against the Roman government. And why they're called thieves uh, is kind of hard to figure out, but, but the original word is, refers to them as being revolutionaries. Okay. So they're on each side of Jesus, right? Well, they went to one of them first, and they broke his legs. Now, why did they break his legs? Because they had a way of holding themselves up to breathe, and when with their legs broken, then they collapsed down pressure on the diaphragm, pressure on the lungs, lungs filled up, and they, and they suffocated and died, okay? Well, then it says that he went to the other thief, and remember, the scriptures say there's one on each side of him, right? They went to the second one, and they broke his legs, and then they went to Yahushua, Jesus, and they did not break his legs because he had already given up his spirit and died. So think about this. If, if there are, oh, I didn't switch over to see this. Today. Okay, sorry. Uh, if there are three crosses in a row like this, why'd they go to the thief on one side and then pass by Yahuwah Jesus and go to the other thief? to do this bone breaking. Right. Well, and I, and I didn't add the slides for this because I didn't know I was going to talk about it, but, <laughs> but if you'll notice that it said, hang the criminals on a tree, 
on a stake, on a tree. Okay? And they probably used an olive tree. So if we'll call this a top-down view of the olive tree. Okay. And you know, it could have branches coming out because it talks about branches in places. I'll do a more in-depth study of this, but I just want to introduce it at this time. But if, if they've got three criminals hanging on a tree, so there's a cross beam, there's a cross beam, there's a cross beam. Is Jesus between them if he's one of them? Yes. If they go, let's say that this is uh, thief one, thief two, and Yahushua, they could go to thief one and thief two and break their legs, and then they go to uh, Jesus and don't break his legs. They don't have to skip him in order to follow through with this. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. So you have the tree in the middle, right? And then how many arms does each thief have? Two. And how many does Yahushua have? So that if you add them all up together in a mathematical way, you come out with six. Okay. You have a central staff, the, the tree of justification, of sacrifice, the, the central staff that represents Yahushua, okay? And then you have six outstretched arms coming off that tree, coming off from the different sides. Uh, like in the shape of a menorah, okay? I, the thing that makes me think that this is true, a true representation, is that every reference says to hang them on a tree. It doesn't say hang them on trees. It says hang them on a tree, singular. So, uh, like I said, I haven't had time to, to dig into it very deeply, but I thought it was interesting enough to bring out so you could see it uh, before, uh, to, just to think about how cool it is that everything revolves around the menorah, everything, because that's the symbol of, of God's care for Israel, the light of the world, all of those things all relate to Jesus and all relate to the menorah. Okay, so back to our, to our text here. I'll try not to do it much more of that. Verse three, and you have borne and have endurance and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have something against you because you have less, left your first ahava. Okay? And uh, I don't think this slide has this one, but we'll see ahava. Remember therefore from where you are fallen, and make teshuva, repentance, and do your first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your menorah out of its place unless you make repentance. Okay, um, yeah, I didn't, I just used the verses, I didn't put that in, but the Ahava, first love in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, uh, Israel's first love was Yahuwah, God. And it's, and it's mentioned in marriage terminology because Jehovah, Yahuwah, Yahweh, whichever name you choose to use from the Tetragrammaton, uh, was the husband of Israel. And we covered some of that because we'll see the wedding supper of the lamb, the wedding supper of God and his people, that he remarries Israel, whom he divorced because of their adultery. Okay? 
All right. But this uh, you have, this, this is a good thing you have. You hate the wicked deeds of the Nicolites, uh, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach, the Spirit, says to the Yisraelite Kahalot, to the, to the congregations of Israel. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the Eitz Kayam, the tree of life, in the midst of the Garden of Eden. Do we have any kind of an idea where, when the new Jerusalem comes down, where it's going to be? Probably going to be right where that Garden of Eden was. And that Tree of Life is probably going to be right where that Tree of Life was. All right, then we looked at the Kehalot, and we looked at the structure of these uh, synagogues that they kept going for hundreds of years after the destruction of Rome, okay? They kept their synagogue life going. So those people who say, well, I have no idea who they are, well, they have record keepers right? in their synagogues who keep track of all of those names. And certainly God keeps track of all of the names. So he knows who the lost sheep of the house of Israel are. So there's the, the Tuve Ha'ir, the board of directors, on the reading right, the Parnas, the executive uh, who runs the operation, the social life of the synagogue, and then the Hevrot, the committee workers, uh, with all anything that needed to be done for the community, that, that's where it happened. And on your reading left, the rabbi was the teacher of the law and interpreted it. The judges made the decisions on whether or not the law was broken and who should repay, what should they pay, all of those kind of things. And then the gabaim are those who were the enforcers, the punishers. And throughout the Middle Ages, they had the power of of uh, life and death. If you did not obey, then you could actually be killed by these punishers, by these enforcers. But now, uh, subsequently, when they quit doing that kind of thing, uh, the Gabaim is the one that, that got the volunteers to say, okay, you're going to read the Torah reading uh, on Shabbat, and you're going to read the Haftorah reading, and you're going to uh, make sure that the candles are, are out and ready, and you're going to light the candles, and I mean, just kind of ran the, the operations of the, uh, of the synagogue. Okay. Verse 8, and the teaching overseer of the Israelite Kehillah in Smyrna write, these things say the first and the last, who was dead and is alive. We could spend a couple of weeks just on that, but you know who that is. That is Yahuwah, Yahuwah's son, Yahushua. And just as in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, God is said to be the first and the last, we have it identified that Jesus is the first and the last. Okay? And here's, here's how we get to that, because he says, I'm the first and the last. I go, oh, okay, Yahuwah, who was, alive, who was dead and is alive. Oh, wait a minute. Yahuwah never died, so this must be the second member of the Godhead, Yahushua, Jesus Christ. Okay, I know your mitzvah, your works, your tribulation, your poverty, poverty but you are rich. Okay. And then the last part of verse 9, chapter 2, and I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Yahudim, and are not, but are the synagogue of S.A. Tan. This is uh, part of my study of deception. This is from 2 Timothy 3.13. So this is Paul writing to Timothy. And he says this, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And I have used this verse many, many times as 
my signature verse for the end times, that it is characterized by people deceiving at the same time they are being deceived. We did that at one time when uh, we were part of Jehovah's Witnesses, and we were deceived, and we went about telling people about Jehovah's Witnesses deceiving others, right? Deceived and deceiving. All right, here's another deception verse. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. Do you have any doubt about who this might be? No, okay. The what? The deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation 12, 9. The, de the deceiver of the whole world. Here's another one, Revelation 13. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Okay. So this is the second beast, and he deceives those who dwell on earth. Revelation 18, and the light of a lamp will shine in you no more, and the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. So... All nations were deceived by your sorcery. More, this is Babylon, by the way. All nations were deceived. And uh, Revelation 19, and the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, the second beast, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. He deceived with his signs. And Revelation 20, and threw, them, threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. So who is this? This is Satan. this is Satan, and this is during the tribulation, I'm sorry, during the millennial era, uh, that he is imprisoned for a thousand years so that he may not do what? He may not deceive the nations. Okay. So all the way through the book of Revelation, starting with chapter 2, meaningless letters to the churches, the congregations, all the way through to the end, we see that deception is a keynote for all of it. Here he is again, and he will come out after that thousand years imprisonment. He will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. Satan is released from the pit and allowed to come out for one last opportunity in spiritual warfare to, for, and humankind uh, testing to see if people will follow him after having lived under the authority of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. It's the last test for humankind. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.10. The devil who had deceived them. Deception, deception, deception. It's quite obvious that the methodology in Revelation is deception. 
Uh, we first see it in our current passage for study. You have tried them who say they are Shlehim and are not, found them to be liars, and our primary subject, the blasphemy, blasphemy of them who say they are Yahudim and are not, but are the synagogue of S.A. Tan. who say and are not. They are deceivers. So let's jump into 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, and 10. This is a Pauline letter. So let's see what he has to say about the future. And he says, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. So who are the victims of deception? Those who refuse to love the truth and to be saved. They will follow through with Satan's deceptions, the lawless one, the Antichrist. Okay. Wicked deception. All right, we know that the methodology of Satan is deception, but we must not lose sight of his end game here. So we jump into Isaiah. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That was his fall. It is his goal to rule in the heavenlies. This is from uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, uh, his book, Satan. There could be but one most high, and the purpose of Satan to become like him could naturally be nothing less than an attempt to dethrone the Almighty. He continues, the secret purpose in his heart reveals his method to be not a violent attack upon the throne, but like Absalom, to steal the hearts of the unfaithful in the kingdom and through subtlety to gain a government, he would thus become an object of worship and attract attention from other beings to himself. So in this, and I don't know how, how much uh, Dr. Schaefer knew this, but he has identified exactly who, or I should say exactly what the goal is of those who say they are Jews and are not to gain a government, become the object of worship and attract the attention from other beings to himself. So if we do it for the synagogue of Satan people, those who say they're Jews and are not, they're, through subtlety, they want to gain a government. Therefore, they could be an object of respect and attract attention and business dealings and protection, and international uh, commerce for themselves. There are two realms we must never forget, spirit kind and humankind. Satan wants both. But we know that he will be thrown down to earth from heaven, and this from chapter 12 in the Revelation. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So what kind of of uh, power does he have in heaven at this point? Nope, he's, he's gone. 
Now his whole thing is, I've got to take the earth. I can't take heaven. I lost that war. Now my war that's left is to take the earth. And where is the earth centered? The land, Israel. Israel is the object of his war to take over for the Most High. So he will lose the spirit kind war. So what is his next ploy? To receive worship from humankind and to indwell his Antichrist and sit on an earthly throne in the Holy of Holies. And guess what? In Revelation chapter 13, and they worshiped the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. For he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? Interesting here that it's not who is like the beast, who can fight against him. It's against it. Hmm, interesting. Um, we'll have to figure that out as we go, won't we? <laughs> so, but see, the dragon receives worship because the beast receives worship. So Satan is achieving his goal. His true nature is uh, revealed, blasphemy, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, two and a half years, three and a half years, three and a half years, why did I say two and a half? It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it also allowed, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Remember the, how our primary passage begins? And I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Yahudim and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So we have a tie-in here that the synagogue of Satan blasphemes and this beast blasphemes. I wonder if they're related. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. Right. You see the word earth there? That's Eretz. That word is translated earth. It's translated land. So anytime you see anything related to Israel and the word Eretz, you have to think, is this talking about the land? Because the land is Israel. Okay. So then I saw another beast rising out of the land. It had two horns like a lamb, looked like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Would that be a deceptive thing? Looking like a lamb and speaking like a dragon? And it's coming out of the land of Israel? It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. So let's put the land in there. But I saw another beast rising out of the land of Israel. It had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the land of Israel and its inhabitants worship the first beast, beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to the land in front of people. Right. So is this taking place in Israel? Is this beast in Israel? Is it the synagogue of Satan? Gee, we'll have to look. We'll have to study this out. And as you saw here, it's the false 
prophet. A false prophet. Uh, remember, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about the different groups in Israel, the ultra-religious, the, the ultra-secular, and we talked about the fact that there were about an equal number of Sephardim and uh, Aja Kazim uh, in Israel, and that in the rabbinical uh, organization uh, there, they have one for the Sephardim and one for the Ashkenazi. And uh, uh, so it's the, and they are the heads of each of those two uh, religious groups that we'll find out if they are really Jews or not. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell in the land telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Technology is a wonderful thing. This plan of Satan's has been going on since the beginning and his takeover of Yahuwah's people Israel is his last ditch effort to avoid his fate. What is his fate? Jesus will say, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's his fate. He has been sentenced to the lake of fire. He's not there yet. He doesn't live in hell. No pitchfork, no, uh, no tail. No horns, none of that. Uh, he's still operating until Revelation chapter 20. He'll still be operational, and his synagogue will be also. Uh, there are other false prophets. John elsewhere calls them many antichrists. In John's uh, epistles, or uh, uh, first, second, third John, he talks about the many antichrists. So here's an opportunity to bring up a point. Oops. To bring up a point here. Um, anti Christ. What does that mean to you? Anti is a prefix that means against, right? But you know, anti is also a prefix that means instead of. And we know that the Antichrist is the one that will be installed in the temple instead of the real Messiah, Yahushua HaMashiach, right? Antichrist. And we, we'll see this coming up anti Semitic. And we think that's in today's vernacular, that's against the, the Semites, which means you're against Israel, even though uh, Arabs are Semites too, but, but it's used as uh, you know, the anti, anti-Semitic attacks in New York City, the anti-Semitic attacks of the radical right-wing uh, Christians, the anti-Semitic attack. Well, yeah, those are the against attacks, but anti also means in place of. Okay. So you always want to keep that in mind anytime you see an anti-something that it can also mean in place of. So if you have an antichrist, a false messiah serving instead of the true messiah, or you see anti-Semitic thinking, oh, people who are against the Semites, how about in place of the Semites? In place of the Semites. 
That's what these anti-Semites are. They want to take over for the true Semites. And so we'll have to see about the true Semites. These false prophets that uh, John talked about in his epistles were also around in Paul, by Paul, or around Paul in the first century. And this is what he says to Titus. Remember, we already had his uh, Timothy chapter 3 quote. Now we have a Titus quote from Paul. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. And then look how he says it especially those of the circumcision party. Who's the circumcision? The Jews. The Jews. The circumcision party are those who say they are Jews but are not. But it's not all Jews. God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Right? The rest were hardened. They, how did we know they were hardened? What did it say earlier? Those who refuse to believe. And then they're hardened. They harden themselves against it. We see that today with people who refuse to accept the gospel. They refuse to accept it, and then they are hardened. They, they become actually, in many cases, uh, not just ambivalent, but violent against it. Where will we see these who say they are Jews but are not? Where will we see them? Well, we see it in the Revelation, the land and its inhabitants worship the first beast. We'll see that false Jews worshiping the false Christ. Those Israelites who are not deceived, the remnant, will be the overcomers we've recently read about. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish but the third part will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. This is Zechariah 13, 8, 9. Okay, so, so, who are the overcomers? Well, let's first start with this. How many overcomers out of the people of Israel will there be? One third. Okay. Zechariah says two parts will be cut off and perish. One third uh, God will bring through the fire to refine them as silver is refined. Find them, refine them as silver is refined. Okay. Um, and actually, if we remember back, and I'm trying to remember back, <laughs> to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, and that the, uh, that the different colors, the gold head and the silver chest and the bronze uh, body and the iron legs and the feet made of iron and clay. You see, each of those uh, metals also have other, other significance in spiritual warfare. Gold is angelic, uh, good angel operations. Silver is uh, bad angel operations. Okay? So read that again uh, and see where it says, and I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined. So they're going to be facing what? And bad angel persecution during the tribulation period. And test them as gold is tested, just like the good angels are tested. Remember I said, 
there are two different worlds being tested for their for their response to God, right? The human kind and the spirit kind, right? So this is the human kind, and look who are the uh, overcomers, the ones who will make it. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. They are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Okay, so now we can begin to look at the not-Jews, uh, who they who the not Jews are by tracing the history in the scriptures and secular history. Not Jews is my term for them. Instead of constantly repeating those who say they are Jews uh, and are not, I'm just going to start calling them the not Jews. Okay. Uh, and uh, it goes back to our Revelation 2 9 verse. I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, but the synagogue of Satan. So let's take our break. Uh, we'll uh, close with prayer, and then we'll take a 10-minute break and come back at, uh, at about 12 after. Father Yahuwah, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful that you have all of this in your hand, that you have it all worked out, that you have it planned, and that you have the execution for it. And we pray for those in this era, this epoch in which we live, will come to see your plan we'll see the plan that you have for us today, and that is to become part of the body of Christ by faith alone in Christ alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back to the second hour of our study today. This is what this is... Uh, January 30th, 2022. Yes, yeah, this month is just about gone. Uh, we are going to pick up with slide 48, which was our last slide of last hour. We're looking at deception. We're about to conclude our deception and revelation section. Uh, we're going to look at the not Jews. That's my term for those who are fulfill the uh, statement in Revelation 2.9, I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. These are evil, atheistic Jews. Okay? They're not all Jews. These are the Jews that Hitler was trying to get rid of uh, in his political campaigns. As a matter of fact, he came up with two plans to get them out of Germany, but the rest of the world would not agree to it. The Jews would not agree to it. And so uh, being an evil man himself, he ended up trying to wipe out all the Jews and not just the evil Jews that were ruining Germany. We'll cover that when we get to that part of our study. But uh, my term, not Jews, uh, is for the for those who say they are but are not. And we're going to trace them through the scriptures and secular history. Because if you, if, you're, if you don't know, the Bible stops a uh, long time ago. And, but the activity of these uh, atheistic uh, not-Jews uh, continue, have continued on after that time. So we need to be able to identify them. We'll identify a lot. Uh, we'll identify the secular history, uh, not Jews, by comparing them to what the scriptures say, okay? But we can tell by how they act, uh, what they are, and what they're doing. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. We'll begin with a little review and then trace some secular history. Remember, we covered the three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, who are at the beginning of the subject and are overlooked by nearly everyone for their importance in identifying those who say they are Jews but are not. Then we identified modern Hebraic identities, the Ashkenazi, the plural Ashkenazim, 
from Hebrew Ashkenaz, Germany. Ashkenaz is what the Jews ended up calling Germany. Uh, members of the Jews who lived in the Rhineland Valley and in neighboring France before their migration eastward to Slavic lands, Poland, Lithuania, Russia, after the Crusades of the 11th to 13th century, and their descendants. Those are all the Ashkenazi. After the 17th century persecutions in Eastern Europe, large numbers of these Jews resettled back into Western Europe, where they assimilated as they had done in Eastern Europe with other Jewish communities. The area in Germany where they settled had been a Jewish enclave for centuries before that, possibly from Roman times, uh, following Alexander's program of taking Jews to distant lands to administer his kingdom. This would indicate that the earliest Jews to settle the area were likely from the Ashkenazi tribe from Japheth. In time, all Jews who had adopted the German Rite synagogue rituals were referred to as Ashkenazim to distinguish them from the Sephardic or Spanish Rite Jews. Okay? Two major uh, enclaves of Jews in Europe. Spain and Germany, and in the East, Poland. Right? Uh, it's another one, but we're right now focusing on Western Europe. And uh, those who came to Germany and adopted the Ashkenazi uh, way of holding the, temp uh, the synagogue services and so on, became known as Ashkenazi. It became cultural, not tribal. Right? The Spanish Jews, who are just amazing, they had, it was the golden era of Jews, under, under Muslim rulership in Spain, when, when the Muslims conquered Spain, uh, they loved the Jews. Right? because the Jews were intelligent, artistic people. And uh, so they, they gave Jews freedom. And I mean, it's a whole, if you look at the way things have changed, now the, the, the Muslims hate the Jews now. They okay? want to wipe them off the map. But back in those days, they were favored people, special rights and privileges. Um, it's amazing. But we'll, we'll cover some of that as we go along. Okay, so now remember the sons of Japheth. Gomer, Magog, Mattai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of, his, uh, uh, of Japheth's first son, Gomer, were Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Tog Tog Togarma. Okay. The sons of his fourth son, Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Katim, and Dodanim. And then it says, from these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans, in their nations. So these were tribes of, of the children of Noah. Right? I'm going to differentiate the children of Noah from the children of Israel because the children of Israel came from one of the sons of Noah. But all of the sons of Noah are not sons of Jacob or sons of Israel. Okay? They are other people. In fact, from them, all the peoples of the earth were, uh, came, uh, except for outposts of different peoples that we'll cover briefly in a future lesson. Today, the Ashkenazim constitute more than 80% of all Jews, Jews in the world, vastly outnumbering Sephardic Jews. In the early 21st century, Ashkenazic Jews numbered about 11 million. In Israel, the numbers of Ashkenazim and Sephardim are roughly equal, and the chief rabbinate uh, has both an Ashkenazic and a Sephardic chief rabbi on equal footing. All Reform and conservative Jewish congregations belong to the Ashkenazic 
tradition. This does not mean that all Ashkenazim are actually from the tribe of Ashkenazi, uh, since it became a cultural religious practice designation, not a tribal identification. So which tribes? That may be a question which cannot be answered at this time, but I'll continue to look for the clues as I study the genetic, the journals of, of genetics and all of that. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a very uh, detailed, uh, boring, <laughs> uh, hard work to go through all of the genetics to see what they've discovered and who they've discovered. In the men, meantime, let us see if we can at least identify the Jews. Uh, so what about the other branch, the Sephardim? Uh, some uh, locality I know, the modern Jews think that Spain is meant, and hence they designate the Spanish Jews Sephardim, as they do the German Jews by the name Ashkenazim, because the rabbis call Germany Ashkenaz, others identify it with Sardis, the capital of Lydia. Now we covered Lydia when we were talking about the uh, ram and the goat and the, the different countries that would, could be involved in the book of Revelation in the wars that took place uh, in the, or that are described to take place in the future in the book of Revelation. Remember the ram charges the goat with two horns and all of that? Well, that uh, one was from Lydia. That's Turkey. Okay? That's from Turkey. So while we don't know if either of these are from the 12 tribes of Israel, we do know that they are identified as Jews, and we know their history in Germany and Spain, so we can follow a trail to determine their fidelity to Yahuwah. Noah had three sons prior to the flood. None are listed after the flood, despite the fact he lived a long time after that. There's even some debate about the birth order of the three, but the consensus is that Shem was first, Japheth second, and Ham the third. This is uh, the passage in uh, Genesis 13. The sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three uh, were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Genesis 9, and he said, uh, I'm sorry, I, did I say 13? I, I meant to 9. Uh, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed uh, the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan will be their servant. So who's the low man on the totem pole here? Canaan, the son of Ham. Okay. What does it say about Shem? Blessed. Does it say blessed about Japheth? No, it doesn't say blessed, but it does say he will dwell in the tents of Shem. So if we go back to my little diagram, And we talk about anti, if the term anti-Shemitic comes from Shem. The Shemites are the sons of Shem. Okay. So if Japheth is going to dwell in the tents of Shem, would that make him an in place of Shemite? In place of the Shemites could be Japheth, right? So who are the sons of Japheth? We just covered them. Gomer was the first son. Javan was the fourth son. Their sons were Ashkenaz and Togarmah. Okay. Ashkenaz were the ones that 
settled Germany, Togorma, the ones who settled Spain. So both Ashkenaz and Sephardim are sons of Japheth. So what are all of the Jews in Israel related to, at least by cultural religious, religio-cultural? Japheth. None of them are related to Shem. Right? But we know that there can be some who are. Uh, but, but it's interesting that, that the, in place of Shemites are from the tribe of Japheth, who will dwell in Shem's tents. That follows through. It, it, it all fits. It's amazing how God does that. It must be smart or something. Okay. In that last slide, we learned three things about the three sons. Ham's descendants through Canaan will be slaves. Shem's descendants will be blessed. Japheth's descendants will be a large number and will dwell in Shem's tents. 80% of Jews are from Japheth. They are Ashkenaz. Okay? So we will need to unpack the shall dwell in Shem's tents as we proceed, because we still don't know if all of the Ashkenaz are, are truly Ashkenazi or uh, truly Japheth, or if some of them might be Jacob. We have to figure it out. While this was significant background information for our understanding of God's future plans and purposes of the descendants of Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Ham, it is now time to dig deeper into those, into who these descendants are, so we can find their place in our study. To stay with the flow of our context, we'll first name some descendants of Ham, okay? And we're just going to mention one, because uh, I found him to be quite interesting. Uh, I've entitled this slide, The First Attempt at Building a Nation. Cush fathered Nimrod. Cush was a son of Ham. Okay. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. A mighty man. Okay. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Erech, Akkad. Kalne in the land in, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth Ir, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. So what was Nimrod doing? He was building a nation. Okay. We see that after the flood, Nimrod is he who begins to consolidate people into city-states and then organizes them around a nation, a kingdom, Babel, at the Tower of Babel, Babylon. Okay. <clears throat> now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come. Let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, we know about a group that have been dispersed over the whole earth, right? Jews, okay, Jews. And... What do the Jews who are not Jews want? What did they want? They wanted a nation. Why? So they would no longer be dispersed and they would have a name for themselves. Okay. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now the sons of Japheth. Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphah, 
and Togerma. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, uh, I'm sorry, I said Tarshish, Tarshish is the ones that settled Spain, not Togerma, uh, Katim and Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own dialect, okay? Remember the difference between uh, Ashkenazi and Sephardim Jews? Uh, they have different uh, dialects, different uh, words that they use in their synagogue uh, services and stuff by their clans, by their tribes, and, by their, and in their nations. Many of these names of the descendants are meaningless to us and will remain so in our current study, uh, but they'll come up again later, but some are of the utmost importance. What does our passage say? Them who say they are Yahudim and are not. Who, what is the Yahudim? Well, let's go back to our uh, look at the descendants of Adam down to Messiah, Jesus. And we've seen this and we notice that uh, number 35 is David, number 36, Nathan. But look up further and see number 10 is Lamech. Lamech's the father of Noah. All right. Then Shem is next. Okay. Shem is next. So now follow from 11 all the way down. Let's see if I can get my pointer out of the way. Follow uh, from Shem, number 12. Follow it down and you get to 22, Abraham. So is Abraham a Shemite? Yes. Abraham's a Shemite. Is Isaac a Shemite? Yeah. Is Jacob a Shemite? Is Judah a Shemite? Are Jews, uh, true Jews, the offspring of Shem? Yes. Can they be the offspring of Japheth? No. Can they be the offspring of Ham? No. They are only the offspring of Shem. Okay. So that narrows it down to a specific line uh, and that line from shem if you watch it goes from from uh, number 12 shem on down to 22 abraham down to 25 judah on down to 35 david on down to uh oh let's pick another one uh 49 joshua uh let's go on down further and let's get all the way down to Heli, number 75, who's the father of Joseph. Okay. And then Jesus is the uh, stepson of Joseph. Not a genetic son, but a stepson. Okay. So is Jesus in the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah? Yes. So does that put him in the line of Shem? Yes. Does it put him in the line of Japheth? No. Does it put him in the line of Ham? No. Okay. So you can wipe out Japheth and Ham from being true Jews. Okay. So anybody who from those other groups who say they are Jews, they are not. Okay. They are the synagogue of Satan. So then we have to go through the children of Israel and those tribes and find out which ones of those can be eliminated so we could find out more of those Jews who are not Jews. Okay? And we covered this uh, last time. It's, uh, this is the same uh, basic. It goes from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and it ends up with Jesus uh, because this is the line from Abraham, not the line from Adam, and it doesn't go through uh, David. To, I mean, and this one goes from David to Solomon, as opposed to uh, Matthew's, which goes through Nathan to skip the jo Jeconiah curse. Okay, all right. Twelve tribes of Israel in the Bible, the Hebrew people who, after the death of Moses, took possession of the promised land of Canaan. All right. 
because the tribes were named after sons or grandsons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, the Hebrew people became known as Israelites. Okay? Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and so the people that were uh, descended from, from Jacob are known as the Israelites. And among the Israelites are the children of Judah, the Jews. When the people fought, they divided into two kingdoms. Israel had 10 tribes. It took the northern half of the country, and Judah and Benjamin took the lower half, Judea. You get where the name Jews come from, from those that lived in Judea. Following the dispersion of the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians, the people came to be called Judah, Jew, after the name of the prominent southern kingdom tribe. Many of the people in the ten tribes, Israel, northern kingdom, actually remained in Judea or escaped there, so they became to, came to be affiliated with Judah. So everybody that we call Judah is not just the tribe of Judah. They are the tribes uh, of the other ten tribes who stayed in Judea or escaped to Judea because they did not like the idolatry that uh, trying to think of his name, the first king of Israel, uh, the northern kingdom. I got too many Jehoadabs and, and all the different names floating in my head right now. I can't remember which one was the, the uh, head man of Israel. We covered it in the past. So not all Jews are Judean tribe of Judah Jews. There are others who are the so-called lost tribes of Judah. There are many references to these so-called lost tribes about which so many theories and myths have arisen in the Bible after they were lost. Okay? The belief in the continued existence of the 10 tribes was regarded as an incontrovertible fact during the whole period of the second temple, that's Herod's temple, that's the time of Jesus, uh, and of the Talmud. Tobit, the hero of the apocryphal book of his name, was depicted as a member of the tribe of Naphtali. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs takes their existence as a fact, and in his fifth vision, Ezra, fourth Ezra, saw a peaceable multitude, these are the ten tribes, which were carried away prisoners out of their own land. Josephus states as a fact the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates till now, and are an immense multitude and not to be estimated in numbers. They settled up northeast of, of Assyria, up in the Baltic region. Okay? Uh, Paul protests in Acts 26 to Agrippa that he is accused for, pay attention, for the hope in the promise of resurrection made by God to our fathers. Fathers are... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the offspring. It is the promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. Why is it judged incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So does Paul say, well, it's only the, the tribe of Judah. It's only the Jews, uh, not the 12 tribes, because Ten of them are lost and are gone forever. No. There were ten tribers living in Judea. Over 700 years following the Assyrian exile, we find a prophetess named Anna from the tribe of Asher in Jerusalem in the early first century mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 36. Okay. Anna was the prophetess who was at the temple when they brought Jesus to be circumcised. Right? And she prophesied that he would be the Messiah, that he was the Messiah. But she was from, I didn't even put, that slide's missing apparently. Uh, she was, I can't think of the tribe now, I'll have to 
I'll have to bring that up later, I guess. Um, Second Chronicles 11, 16, those uh, from every tribe of Israel who set their hearts on seeking the Lord, the God of Israel, followed the Levites to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to the Lord, the God of, our, of their ancestors. They strengthened the kingdom of Judah and supported Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the king of, of Judea, okay, the southern kingdom. So, so the Levites were the priests. And Levites were scattered among all 12 tribes. They had no inheritance of their own. They, they worked with all the 12 tribes as priests. Well, the Levites left Israel, the northern kingdom, to go down to the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, those from every tribe of Israel who set their hearts on seeking the Lord. In other words, the non-idolaters followed the Levites to Jerusalem, and they, many of them, stayed in Judea. So we have members of the 10 tribes in Judea. They're not, they were not lost. Okay. So we see some of the 10 northern tribes lived in the southern kingdom of Judah and would also be aware of their tribal identities. And the final proof, Matthew 10, 6, and Matthew 15. Jesus says, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. They knew where they were. They weren't lost. They had addresses. Okay. And Jesus answered and said uh, to the, the woman who wanted her him to heal her daughter. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, what was he doing in Judea? If they were lost 700 years before and scattered over the entire world and nobody knew who they were. Do you think he knew? I think he knew. As we saw when we reviewed the beliefs of the citizens of Israel, clearly Israel is a Zionist nation state and not populated by religious Hebrews. Only 22% are religious, with 78% with almost no real interest in their sacred texts or their Messiah. It's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the Jews in Israel are not real Jews. Okay? They are... Zionist Jews. They are nation state people. They wanted a nation. Okay. However, as the religious Haredim believe, the nation of Israel should only be established by the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah 10 6. I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. House of Joseph is the 10 tribes. Okay and I will bring them back. Circle that last sentence uh, in your notes, and I will bring them back. Jeremiah 12, 15, and it will come about that after I have uprooted them, I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them back. Circle that one. Each one to his inheritance, and each one to his land. Zechariah 10.10, 10, I will bring them back, circle that, from the land of Egypt, gather them from Assyria, and bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, until no room can be found for them. Jeremiah 31.8, see, I will bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the ends of the earth. With them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Ephraim was the son of Joseph. And that's who the land covenant goes through is Ephraim, through Joseph to Ephraim. Okay, so what does he say? In the very first sentence, see, I will bring them. Circle that. 
and some more. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them. Circle that. Verse 27, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the offspring of men and animals. See, he knows who Israel and Judah are, and he's going to plant them. Ezekiel 37, and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and will bring them into their own land. So I would circle, thus saith the Lord God, and I would circle, and I will bring them into their own land. Ezekiel 34, and I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will bring them out. Circle that. Ezekiel 11, therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people. I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. Jeremiah 23, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the land. In the land. Okay. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. Are they lost? If they are, they won't be. And thus is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord of righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that they shall no more say. This is what they'll no more say. The Lord liveth which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But this is what they'll say. The Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whether I have driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Amen. So be it. So if the Messiah is to bring them back, and there are many more passages that say he will, who did it in 1948, Messiah or someone else? Someone else. So that leaves us with a quandary. Is the land of Israel right now God's land of Israel? No. no. Do 80% of them believe? that they're citizens of a country and not children of God? Yeah. Zionism is not Judaism or Israelism, okay? That is a fake Jew nation. A fake Jew nation. Now, do we pray for the peace of Israel? Yes, because there are believing Jews there. A very small number. What number did we find? 28%. Right? Just over a fourth of the people there. And are they persecuted by the rest? Yes. Persecuted by their own people, just as the scriptures say they will be. Okay? But because they are there, the remnant is there, and more from the remnant will God will bring back to the land, because that is the land. There's no doubt about that's Israel. So God will bring them back there, but God did not bring them there yet. Okay? This was a 
socio-political uh, maneuver so that rich, powerful Jews could have the protection of nationhood for their schemes. Right? Because you can be rich in a country, but if that country turns on you, what's going to happen to you? You'll be shot. You'll be killed in some manner or other. But if you have your own country that you're the leader in, what can happen to you? You're in charge. You protect each other. You protect yourselves. Right? So, yeah. so, so just like we see corruption in the United States, in Great Britain, in France, in Belgium, in Italy, in Greece, and every country of the world, we see those who use the protection of the fact that they are a nation to be able to perpetrate their evil. Well, just as it's so in all of those countries, it is also the plan of those who say they are Jews but are not to use the nation of Israel as their cover for what they do. We want a king like all the nations. While this cry has different motivation, it has been the cry of the Zionists for over 300 years. Who are the Zionists? Zionism, the Jewish nationalist movement, has had as its head goal the creation and support of a Jewish national state in Palestine, the ancient homeland of the Jews. Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Though Zionism originated in Eastern and Central Europe, in the latter part of the 19th century, it is in many ways a continuation of the ancient attachment of the Jews and of the Jewish religion to the historical region of Palestine, where one of the hills of ancient Jerusalem is called Zion. In the 16th and 17th centuries, a number of messiahs came forward trying to persuade the Jews to return to Palestine. The Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment movement of the late 18th century, however, urged Jews to assimilate into Western secular culture. Many of the Jews who had been dispersed or relocated in Europe since the time of Alexander continued in their positions as financial experts, augmented tremendously by the fact that early Christendom forbade the loaning of money with usury or interest, leaving open an entire, entire industry of banking. The Haskalah, uh, also spelled uh, Haskalah, <laughs> uh, uh, from the Hebrew, sekel means reason or intellect. These are the intellectual, the smart group. Right? You know, those people that know more than everybody else does, who, who aspire to lead a nation, right? Just like in our country. And you hear people say, oh, they think they know more than we do. They try to tell us to do what they say because they know more than we do. That's the same throughout the world. There are those who think they're smarter than everybody else. And because of that, they deserve what they want. Okay. All right. Um, the uh, 18th, 19th century intellectual movement among the Jews of Central and Eastern Europe attempted to acquaint Jews with the European and Hebrew languages <coughs> and secular education and culture as supplements to the traditional Talmudic studies. Talmudic studies are, are the rabbis who wrote all this stuff after God wrote the Bible, okay? The Talmud is not Bible. Remember Jesus getting after the Pharisees and saying, you know, your traditions, well, that, that was the oral law that became the Talmud. It's what the, what the smart people said they should do to worship God properly. Like, don't take the packs off your, off your donkey's back after sundown on the Sabbath, but if you loosen the cinch on it and it falls off, that's okay, but if you take it off, that's work, and you should die. Okay. And Jesus said, which one of you, if you have a sheep fall in a ditch on the Sabbath, won't get it out? Okay. All right. 
these banker Jews grew in wealth and influence and wanted their poor countrymen to improve their lot by following in the banker's education uh, ed educational integration footsteps. Their influence, influence grew greater and greater, and we will see the extent and ominous results in secular world history in several wars, slavery, and intrigue. Most of the evil conspiracy theories you've heard about the Jews arose around the banker Jews. Now, you have people all through the world who hate the Jews, but the common Jewish people are not the ones who did these things. It's only a select group of those Jews, the atheistic, communistic, non-believing Jews. They're the enemies of God. Right? He calls them that, okay? That they financed both sides of World War I and World War II. Did you hear that? Okay, have you heard that before? Yeah, they financed the German war machine and they financed the Americans in the same war. Okay? Um, that they were behind the Bolshevik Revolution. Less than 1% of the Russian population was Jewish. Over 75% of the Bolshevik Revolution leadership was Jewish. Right? Communism that came out of Bolshevism. Russian Jews, Stalin, Trotsky, Lenin, all Jews, okay? The evil, atheistic Jews. The slave trade and more. You're going to learn stuff about the slave trade you'll never know. We always associate the slave trade with the Americans and the British and all that. It was started by the Jews who left Jerusalem when it was destroyed by the Romans they were the merchant Jews. They had ships, and they, they went and got slaves and sold them to make money. Okay? We'll see quotes from history about that. Okay. Then they teamed up with the Muslims when the Muslims became big in the slave trade. Uh, it, they partnered with them. Okay? We have historic quotes about that, all right? Uh, that the evil, greedy, greedy banker Jews so destroyed Germany's 1920s economy that it gave rise to the anti-Semitism that bolstered the popularity of the murderous Adolf Hitler. Now, as one, one author said, do you think Hitler arose in a vacuum? Do you think he won an election with, uh, with what do you have, 80, 90% of the vote? Uh, for no reason other than he was a good-looking guy with a great, a great speech. Yeah, no, they were all tired of the atheistic banker Jews stealing from them. So they wanted someone who was going to get the Jews out. Was Hitler evil? Yes, but Hitler tried in, in the 1930s, he tried to get what, well, the second plan that he had was called the Madagascar plan. He wanted to give them the island of Madagascar to, for the Jews to move to, to get them out of Germany. Right. And everybody, everybody thwarted him. So he ended up, oh, I just have to, have to have a final solution to the Jewish problem, okay? All right, we're gonna see all of those things. See that, Despite the fact we love the people of Israel, we have to be discerning about which people of Israel we love and support. There are a lot of evil organizations in the nation of Israel now. Do you know? Let me do one last thing. What time is it? Oh, well, okay, we're still. I'm going to do one last thing. Let's do this. You know what that is? Okay. You know what that is? You know what the official real symbol of Israel is? The menorah. Oh, yeah. But the Zionist nation chose 
Right. And that is, that is um, a design following the shield of David. You, anybody drink Mogan David wine at Passover? It's, yeah, that's Mogan David, shield of David. And that is what way his shield was made. And each of those points were sharpened. So his shield was an offensive weapon as well as a defensive weapon. So as people charged him, instead of just blocking them with a shield, he could turn it and he could kill them. Right? So that's their, their symbol for their nation is a symbol of war, not the menorah, the symbol of Jesus, the Shamash, the light of the world. Right? All right. So I think that probably pretty well covers today's class. Oh, I did have another. Way. I I don't. Did I give you all of this in your notes? Today's notes. I thought I left off today's notes with this. Wherever it was. Well, we don't have enough time to get into the Haskalah that we. Uh, Oh yeah, we're in the 100s now. So I didn't get, I didn't uh, slice the end of these off. So your your notes ended where I just ended, right? Okay, all right. So yeah, I think you had these notes uh, last week when I was going to cover all of this before I decided we needed the deception part first. You think that was a good idea? The deception part kind of help you to understand so that you can. Uh, see what's going on with the rest of it. All right, let's pray. Father Yahuwah, we are grateful for your eternal purpose to bring all things together in heaven and earth in one, in Christ Jesus. We are grateful that we get to be a part of your eternal purpose by our decision to trust in him, trust his work, and not our own, so that we might be part of his body. We thank you for the earthly part of your plan, the people of Israel, the people of Jacob, and we pray for those who are truly your people and not those who say they are but are not. Show us how we might be of benefit to them who are, and how we may ignore them who are not, and not support their Zionistic, warlike goals and policies. We thank you for all of this. Ask you that you bless our study in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, the Savior of the Jews, and Jesus, our Savior. Amen.